Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com on Roku Dwyer Boxing News. For premium picks, DwyerSportsBetting.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's get outside the box a bit in this video. I like to think of fights before they're announced, sometimes before they were even contemplated. Now sometimes size in the ring, physical mass, actually has a negative impact on the bigger fighter. Do you remember that Nikolai Valuev, David Hay fight, where Valuev was just too big and too slow to catch up with David Hay. David Hay was able to literally just circle him the entire fight, come in, fight when he wanted, and then just take a step back to get away from Valuev. There was little Valuev could do. David Hay was simply too fast for him. Historians will look back even further and we'll see that Evander Holyfield was too fast for Nikolai Valuev. In fact, I would argue that it was Holyfield who actually set the blueprint for David Hayes' victory. The scoring in the Holyfield fight, questionable at best. But what was apparent was that Valuev simply didn't have the foot speed or the flexibility to deal with an opponent who could stay outside, come in, then get back outside. There's a division right now in boxing that quite frankly is more loaded than most. And the guys in that division have skill sets that in my opinion would allow some of them to jump the fence and to actually fight heavier opponents, like David Hay fought Valuev, even though both were heavyweights. Valuev was much heavier than David Hay. I believe the guys in this division could actually jump the fence and could fight super middleweights and give a particular super middleweight a lot of trouble. Now I'm talking about the middleweight division. In particular, I'm talking about four guys in that middleweight division. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Dmitry Pirog, Gennady Golovkin, right, and Daniel Gill. Now, the champion that I believe at 168 pounds that they would give a lot of trouble to is Carl Froch, right? It's just a matter of styles. Now, before I begin, let me just point out that Carl Froch has one of the most impressive resumes in boxing. I believe a plausible argument can be made that Carl Froch is a Hall of Famer, right? Keep in mind, Carl Froch beat John Pascal when Pascal was unbeaten and Pascal went on to be light heavyweight champion, right? Carl Froch has also beaten fighters like, most recently, Mikael Kessler, in my opinion, a boxing Hall of Famer, as well as others like Arthur Abraham, when Abraham was more highly regarded, Jermaine Taylor in America, when Carl Froch, quite frankly, was the underdog in that fight. And of course, Carl Froch beat people like Glenn Johnson and countless others, right? Carl Froch is a quality champion. But I've long said that I believe that he is the second best at 168 pounds in the United Kingdom. I would take James DeGale over Carl Froch because I believe Carl Froch while a master at fighting long, would have a problem on the inside with James DeGale. Throw in the fact that, quite frankly, James DeGale is ambidextrous. 
and can actually come in and fight you as a southpaw. Throw in the fact that Carl Frotch doesn't have the foot speed to get away from James DeGale. Right? And in my opinion, you would have an intriguing matchup, much more intriguing than Carl Frotch against George Groves. And let me just point out, I know Groves beat the Gale. Again, styles make fights. Groves is a mover with knockout power in both hands. Right? Groves has foot speed. Groves has hand speed. Groves is best circling you on the outside. Right? But Groves has had some near car wrecks. Right? That Francisco Sierra fight was a near disaster for Groves. Groves looks like someone who conceivably might not have the upper hand if Carl Frotch cuts off the ring. The difference between Groves and the Gale, in my opinion, is that if Carl Frotch cuts off the ring on James the Gale, Frotch would be getting himself in trouble, right? Now, that said, I believe a Frotch-Groves fight is a close fight. I'm not sure if I know who wins that fight. I understand Carl Frotch has the experience, understand George Groves has the hand speed and the foot speed. And don't fool yourself, both of those guys have punching power, right? It's conceivable that Groves could circle Carl Frotch for 12 rounds, making the foot speed differential an issue. But let's get back to what I was talking about earlier, the middleweights. Let's talk about Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. for a moment. Now, he just fought a very complicated opponent, Sergio Martinez. Understand Martinez is a nightmare for someone like Chavez Jr. Chavez Jr. is bigger than Martinez, but Martinez has the foot speed advantage. Martinez also knows how to hide his upper body, is a southpaw, and hits hard, and can, of course, outmaneuver Chavez Jr. Chavez Jr. couldn't set up shop inside. Critics of Chavez Jr. should not read too much into his loss to Martinez because Martinez is an elite fighter. That was a tough matchup for Chavez Jr. But here's what you need to know about Chavez Jr. He fought Andy Lee, an excellent fighter, right? Now, Andy Lee told his then trainer, Emmanuel Stewart, that it felt like he was fighting the Incredible Hulk. He could not believe Chavez Jr.'s punching power. Chavez Jr. blew out Andy Lee. Now, keep in mind, Andy Lee has a great jab, just like Carl Frotch. But Chavez Jr. was able to get inside on Andy Lee. And unlike Sergio Martinez, who bends at the waist so it's hard to hit him up top, Andy Lee, like Carl Frotch, stands mostly upright. Now, Chavez Jr., is one of the best inside fighters in the sport. Look at the tape of his fight against Sebastian Zvik. Right? When Chavez Jr. gets inside, you're talking about very heavy body punches from a guy who doesn't need a lot of space to generate power. I believe Chavez Jr. against Carl Frotch would be an intriguing matchup. Keep in mind, Chavez Jr. is big for a middleweight. I believe Chavez Jr. belongs at 168. I believe Chavez Jr. is one of the harder punchers out there. I think he at least matches Carl Frotch in punching power. And just like Chavez Jr. was able to get by Andy Lee's jab, I think sooner or later he would get by Carl Frotch's jab. If he gets inside on Carl Frotch, I think Chavez Jr. would have the advantage. That'd be a physical fight. But I believe Chavez Jr. is a credible 
opponent. If Chavez Jr. fights Carl Frotch, I think you'd be able to get outstanding odds on Chavez Jr. I believe he'd be the value play. Let's go one step further. Dmitry Pirog. If you don't know the name, you need to know it. This guy, quite frankly, has some of the best feet in the sport. He is ambidextrous, just like James DeGale. He can fight you righty. He can fight you lefty. I believe he would be able to get inside on Carl Frotch. I believe he would be able to smother Carl Frotch. Dmitry Pirog fights several styles. One of them allows him to come inside on you and to literally put his forearms on your body. I think that this is a classic matchup where the middleweight would just be too fast for the super middleweight. I understand Dmitry Pirog has been out of the ring for some time, but understand as I make this video, he remains an unbeaten fighter. I believe he's unbeaten for a reason. Let's talk about another fighter, Daniel Giel. You know, Daniel Giel already has gone to Germany and has beaten a guy with one of the sport's best jabs, Felix Sturm. Right now, if Giel was able to time Felix Sturm's jab, get inside on Sturm and pepper him, with aggressive punches. Why does anyone think that he can't do that against Carl Frotch? Let's also remember too that an argument can be made that Giel has faced incredibly tough competition. I view Anthony Mundine as a very tough opponent. I view Roman Karmazin as a very tough opponent, right? I believe Daniel Giel, quite frankly, has dealt with savvy opponents who, knows how, who know how to use length and who have long jabs. I also believe that his volume is far greater than Mikael Kessler's volume. Daniel Giel is a guy who will come in and who will hit you with three or four jabs in a row. I also feel that Carl Frotch, after winning the first three rounds against Mikkel Kessler, leveled off in that fight. The last nine rounds were fought to a standstill. And the one thing you know about Daniel Giel is Daniel Giel is a very strong finisher. I think Daniel Giel would have a chance against Carl Frotch. Finally, the last name, and this might be the most intriguing name. Janady Golovkin. You know, Golovkin can fight you inside. Golovkin's also patient and he knows how to avoid your jab. Golovkin is a murderous body puncher. Just ask Matthew Macklin, right? You're talking about a patient guy with a big punch who should be able to get underneath on Carl Frotch who, in my opinion, would have the upper hand inside on Carl Frotch, right? Add it all up, and quite frankly, some middleweight is going to jump the fence and is going to call out guys at 168 pounds. Since Andre Ward, and let me just state bias here, Andre Ward has been a legal client of mine, uh, on a matter, right? But since Andre Ward fights inside better than Carl Frotch, I don't believe he's as vulnerable as Carl Frotch is to these guys, right? Same thing with James DeGale. Understand James DeGale is a master inside and he's ambidextrous, just like Andre Ward, right? I think those guys would have the size advantage and would be able to muscle with the guys at 160. But Carl Frotch is more of a long range fighter. He's more of a Vladimir Klitschko. 
And the problem with that style is if a fast guy gets inside and has a foot speed advantage and can maneuver around Carl Frotch's long jab, that guy could cause problems, right? Carl Frotch is a technician who isn't blessed with great hand speed, right? Carl Frotch sets it up so you're running into his jab. If you want to see vintage Frotch, look at the first three rounds of the Kessler fight. Right? The problem, though, is sometimes smaller guys are faster than bigger guys. Right? The other problem, right? Dmitry Pirog, I feel, is qualitatively faster than Carl Frotch. Right? The other problem is that a fighter like Chavez Jr., can live inside as he did with Sebastian's Vic, throwing power punches. I'm not sure if Carl Frotch has enough to keep Chavez Jr. from getting inside on him. So as we go forward, I know right now Carl Frotch is riding high, deservedly so. He's a champion who has taken hard fights. He was in the the finals of the Showtime Super 6 tournament, right? And, of course, he avenged his loss to Mikkel Kessler. Carl Frotch is a champ who deserves to have the belt around his waist. But at the end of the day, regardless of resume, styles make fights, right? Even though James the Gale lost to George Groves, I'd take the Gale over Carl Frotch. As for George Groves, I have little doubt that George Groves would be able to outmaneuver Carl Frotch. I understand Carl Frotch caught up with Lucy and Butte. Looking at that film, Butte gave away, in my opinion, too many of his physical advantages. Right? I'm not sure if George Groves would make the same mistake. And of course, at 160, that division, simply put, is loaded. I think Chavez, I think Pirog, I think Golovkin, and I think Gil would all be a handful for Frotch at 168 pounds. The one champ at 160 who I think Frotch would be able to walk through is a champion who, quite frankly, Oscar De La Hoya feels is the best at 160, and that's Peter Quillen, right? Kid Chocolate is charismatic. I just don't see the volume. I do see the punching power, but Carl Frotch hits hard too, and in my opinion, is slicker in the ring. Right? So, I would expect Frotch to beat Quillen, but I'm not expecting that to happen if he fights Chavez, Pirog, Golovkin, or Daniel Gill. Controversial video understood sometimes controversy actually happens let me know what you think let me know if i'm picking on carl frotch what i'm going to try to do is to just talk style matchups going forward with big names and then try to compare and contrast i think carl frotch would have a problem with a lot of the guys at 160. i also think james de gale quite frankly is one of the most underrated fighters in the sport let me hear from you on both counts. Thanks for stopping by.